Okay, well, now that Alfred is here, um, let's get started. So good evening and welcome to tonight's AC Transit Candidate Forum for the at-large district seat. My name is Scott Awades and I'm a board member with the East Bay Transit Riders Union or EBTRU and an Oakland resident and I will be your host tonight. So on November 8th, residents living in the AC Transit District will cast votes for four seats on the AC Transit Board. The directors representing wards three, four, and five and one at-large director seat. The at-large seat is the focus of tonight's event. As one of two at-large members on the AC Transit Board, this director will represent the entire area AC Transit serves from Richmond and San Pablo through Oakland all the way down to Fremont. The incumbent in the seat is director at large, Joel B. Young, who is running for re-election and who we invited to, to take part in this forum. Director Young didn't respond to our invitation, but we are grateful that Alfred Tu, the other candidate for this seat, has joined us for the forum tonight. The event is proudly co-sponsored by EBTRU, Seamless Bay Area, and Bike East Bay. And before we get started, I'd like to invite each of our co-sponsors to say a few words about their organizations. So first, uh, John from EBTRU. Hi, uh, good evening. I'm John Minot representing uh, East Bay Transit Riders Union. Um, we uh, stand for convenient, inclusive, and abundant transit in the East Bay um, across the ag many agencies. Great. And next up is Ian. Good evening. Um, my name is Ian Griffiths, uh, and I'm with Seamless Bay Area, and Seamless is proud to co-sponsor this forum. Seamless Bay Area is a nonprofit dedicated to creating an integrated world-class public transit system in across the Bay Area. Uh, and thanks for thanks for joining us this evening, uh, Alfred. Awesome. And last we have Dave. Good evening, everyone. Dave Campbell, I'm advocacy director with Bike East Bay. We do bike head advocacy in Contra Costa Alameda counties. And while we're hard at work making streets safer for walking and biking, uh, we're working more and more to improve transit because we know that good transit is a good bikeway and we have to have good transit in order to have good bicycling. And in particular, while you know, forums like this are important, we need good local transit. We need to get, give people options to get out of their cars, uh, either onto the bus, walking or biking. If they're on the bus, that's one less car on the road. So it's safer for everyone else out on the street. So Bikey Spay, happy to co-sponsor. Awesome. Well, thanks to all three of you and your orgs for putting this event on. And so all of us are committed to transparency in conducting candidate forums. And typically in a forum featuring multiple candidates, we would stick to an agreed upon list of questions and provide each candidate with a set amount of time to respond to each. However, since only one candidate agreed to appear at tonight's forum, we will be taking a slightly more conversational approach. And I'll speak with Alfred for around a half hour, and then we will transition into a Q&A session with your pre-submitted as well as uh, questions submitted via Zoom. So feel free to enter your questions for Alfred into the Zoom Q&A tool at any time. And in the back half of the event, we will kind of go through those questions. Um, we're going to get through as many questions as we can, including both the pre-submitted and the live questions, but we won't be able to ask every one, and we may also edit or combine some to save time. So this is a nonpartisan informational event meant to acquaint you with candidates and issues of importance in this race. Um, member organizations will be sharing additional information on this race after the event. And so to, to stay in touch, please make sure to connect with EBTRU, Seamless Bay Area, and Bike East Bay by joining their mailing lists or following them on social media. We are going to post org websites in the chat for the event. And Finally, I want to note that this event is being recorded and will be posted publicly afterwards. So with that, I'd like to invite Alfred Tuu, candidate for the AC Transit District at large seat, to provide a brief, roughly two minute introduction of himself to kick off tonight's conversation. So welcome, Alfred. All right, thank you. How's the sound volume? Sounds good to me. 
Great. Hi, everybody. My name is Alfred Tu, and I'm running for the AC Transit Board of Directors. So as all of us know, transit is at a crossroads right now. We've got the challenges from the pandemic, remote work, but also the future, the opportunities as we move to a more transit-oriented mode of living and re less reliance on driving to get around. And so as you always say, when you get to a crossroads and you want to know where to go, you want to look at the rest of the map. And that's where I feel I do really well at, is both having worked in the Democratic Party with delegates from around the state on state legislation around transportation, on changing local policy, on regional policy, such as the seamless bill that we had this year. These are all things that I know we need to do. And then in addition, besides having worked with local electeds and local leaders throughout the district, I've also got my own background as an architect who's worked on transit projects, on transit-oriented development and affordable housing near stations and bus lines. And finally, as a bus rider myself, I'm calling in here from the roof of the Transbay Terminal where I'll be taking a bus home later tonight after this meeting. And I use not just the buses, but also BART and biking to get around, often all part of the same trip. And it's that personal experience that I bring as well, both as someone who rides transit right now in Berkeley, but also someone who rode transit down in Fremont, where it was a bit more challenging, but I figured out how to make it work. And with that, I'll take questions. Awesome, thank you. I am jealous of your breezy location as it's very hot in the East Bay. Um, and so my first question for you to kind of start maybe light is, what is your favorite bus route and why? Sure, I would say the one I ride the most is the 51B. And it's where it runs from Rockridge through UC Berkeley through downtown and then down to the marina. And it's a very busy line. And I, it was one of my first lines that I rode. When I was a student at Cal, there was a saying that wherever you're going, you get on to 51. And this was before the line was split, which <laughs> has its ups and downs. So we can get to mm -hmm. that later. Cool. Thank you. And um, how? So I, I want to talk about um, service levels and how they compare to pre-pandemic. Um, how could you kind of update us on how the 51B is doing? So the 51B is actually doing pretty good. That one didn't really have too many cutbacks and continues to be very reliable. However, I would say that reliability has been a huge issue. I know we're all glad that service is restored, but I feel that it may have been a little bit too ambitious at times, where it still results in a lot of missed runs. Mm -hmm. My take as a transit rider is that I'd rather have a bus that's scheduled to come every 30 minutes that I know will come versus a bus that might show up every 20. And that's mm -hmm. the effort I would take going forward. Cool. Thanks. And so, you know, broadly for AC Transit, we are still operating well below the pre pandemic service levels which were low to begin with. And so what would you do as director to bring the district closer to service restoration? Sure. So right now, one of the biggest limiting factors to service restoration is the amount of staff that's available. Mm -hmm. COVID hit bus operators pretty hard, continues to. And of course, there's also the very high cost of living that prices out not just bus operators, but a large group of the whole Bay Area. And that's made restoring staffing levels very challenging. So I think part of it is we need to pay people better if we are to continue making this a career people can hold for their hope. Uh, of course, there's also the question of funding, but I think this is where that transit-oriented development really comes in well. Because with AC Transit, unlike some of the other agencies, AC was never that reliant on Fairbox for 
funding. And most of the funding comes from sales taxes, property taxes. And so when the population increases and there are more people shopping, when there are new buildings built, paying more taxes, that in turn is money that can be used to expand and restore service. Okay, and so what is that? What does that kind of look like? If, if you, I mean, do you want to share a little more about how, how, what transit oriented, oriented develop, development would look like, and how you would kind of help AC Transit get there? Sure. So while the transit oriented development, there's many forms of it. The, probably the most visible is the BART station parking lots, but it also can be just buildings along existing bus lines, and not just on the commercial street itself, but also the residential streets that are quieter and more actually a bit more pleasant to live on than the main commercial highways. And while AC Transit does not have its own land use planning power directly, there are some state laws that kick in depending on how much bus service there is. And then of course, there's the opportunity to work with all the different cities where if the cities are planning street improvements to get improved bus service, then it's also a good time to look at, well, let's make sure that there's opportunity for people to live near this new service as well. Is that something that a director can, can do or how would a director kind of make that happen? So the way that the AC Transit currently works with the cities is there are many interagency liaison mm -hmm. committees where directors from AC Transit as well as city council members get together and discuss things. That's one pass forward. Okay, thank you. That's I'd love to hear more about that another time. Um, and but to pivot a little bit, um, what does AC Transit need to do to become truly accessible to people with disabilities? And what would you do to achieve that? Sure. So one thing I've noticed riding the buses is the one that seems to be the most accessible is the Tempo BRT line, because that has level boarding, where the bus comes right up to the platform and this little bridge sticks out from the bus so that people can roll right on. And the stations are also nice and level, have ramps leading up to them. And that's really the kind of experience we got to be giving people if we are really being fully accessible. Mm -hmm. And so that's one thing to look at more in the long term of gradually upgrading lines to have level boarding, which also speeds up service for everybody else. And in the short term, though, just basic things like having bus shelters and with seating, especially at places such as hospitals and other <laughs> major facilities that people with more mobility challenges might need to go to. That's the very first thing we could do at least. Okay, thank you. And let's let's talk a little bit about um, safety. And so first, what actions should AC Transit be taking to let riders and operators feel safe from a public health perspective? Sure. So I think the current mask requirements have been pretty successful at restoring kind of some safety because we're not out of COVID yet. And it's been an important issue for a lot of people, especially those with weakened immune systems. Uh, I know for the bus operators, even before the pandemic, they had been asking for those plastic barriers by the driver's seat to help cut down on people who were assaulting bus drivers, which is a huge issue that made the news several years ago. Um, when you think about the, the current mask mandate, um, when, when do you think that should go away? Like how long is, is realistic to have, have a, such a mandate? Because I know it, it varies by agency and by region quite a bit. Well, I would say we've, there's talk about a new booster shot that's coming in this fall that might be more able to control these new variants. And I think that might be a good point at which we can revisit it. Okay. But, yeah, and back to the topic of safety, I would say yeah. that besides just the experience on a bus, we need to be looking at 
the experience of getting to the bus and getting from the bus to wherever they're going. So that means traffic safety, making sure we have traffic calming, we have sidewalks that are safe, we have crosswalks that are safe, that we don't have speeding. The International Boulevard has been a huge issue with cars using the bus lane for speeding because there weren't any physical obstacles to keep cars out. So that's something I would look at is, are there ways we can retrofit that bus lane? For example, the speed cushions, which are small speed bumps that buses can drive right over, but slow down cars. That could be a way to help cut down on all the crashes we've been having. And so with, with improvements like those kind of traffic safety ones you're talking about, um, what, what kind of work do you see yourself doing to actually execute on that? Right, so something like that would have to be a collaboration with the cities. And I feel that's where I can really shine because I've been working so much with all the different local elected officials. I've been campaigning with some of the Oakland candidates that are running for mayor and city council. So hope to have relationships with many of them going forward so that can help get things done when we need right. to fix things. Okay, thank you. And as a quick aside, here's a reminder for viewers to uh, submit questions via the Q&A tool um, and we will try to get to as many as we can. Um, okay, so um, one more kind of safety related question is what about um, addressing and preventing violence, you know, on board and around buses, you know, against riders and, and drivers. Um, what would you kind of do to, to mitigate that and, and protect people from uh, threats, I guess, on board? Sure. So I think a good thing to look at is what BART has been doing as far as improving rider safety. They have the ambassador program, as well as the anti-sexual harassment campaign that they're doing. With AC, it's a little bit different because of just the differences between bus operations versus train operations. Mm -hmm. But I think that that could be something to look at. I know there's state legislation currently going on about investing in both data monitoring and an actual follow-up action to reduce harassment and violence on transit and in public spaces. It's part of the stop anti-Asian hate, but it's mm -hmm. also intended to expand for any kind of group that's experiencing any kind of threats. And ultimately, this is an issue that transit agencies cannot solve on their own, and it requires the rest of the local and state governments to work with us. Okay, great, thank you. And so what do you... Um, what do you think about current AC transit fare levels and policies and, and how, how, if at all, how should they be changed? Sure. So I would say that right now, AC is a bit behind the curve on some fare policy where most agencies have gone to a free transfer policy where you pay once, you ride as many buses as you want for a couple of hours. AC is one of the last ones where that second bus, you got to pay a second fare. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't really make sense, both from an affordability point of view. Most bus riders are low income. And it doesn't really make sense from a systems planning point of view either, because often you want there to be transfers so you can have direct lines. And so the first thing I would work on on fare policy is aligning our transfer policy with the rest of the region. and then. Beyond that, working on the seamless effort to get free transfers between AC and BART and all the other agencies that we link up with. How would something like that affect um, operating costs? And you know, I, I would guess you're, you're collecting less revenue when you have free transfers. So how do you make that happen? Well, one thing that we have going on right now is there is the Bay Pass pilot program. And from that, we can get some data on when people are getting these free transfers, are they taking additional trips? Are they taking the same amount of trips? And that will help mm -hmm. guide us on how do we allocate the funding fairly. And maybe because 
the trips are cheaper if people will be taking more of them and mm. <laughs> it won't really matter. I think ultimately where I want to get to is transit is that we need funding sources that are more stable than fares because you don't want your transit funding to depend on whether there's a recession mm. or there's a pandemic or if the local sports team made the championship series, you might get extra money one year, but not mm -hmm. the next. <laughs> so uh, I think that uh, some of the past programs that some of the large employers and universities do, that's something we could gradually bring to more and more places because that provides good, stable revenue. Cool. Thank you. And and I, I appreciate the um, pushback on the idea that free transfers would, would make, would lower revenue because yeah, I agree that data um, is what will help us understand that rather than the, that assumption. And right. so um, do you believe that AC Transit listens sufficiently to rider input in decision-making or um, if not, what kind of change do you think is necessary? I would say that it depends. There's definitely riders like some of us here who are more plugged in. <laughs> We're more plugged into the process. But your average rider experience is probably going to be very different. And I know with BART, they have done a lot of onboard surveys where I've encountered BART staff talking to people while they're on the trains and giving them a survey. I think that's the, that's the, the best way to get good, accurate mm -hmm that actually represents the cross-section of the riders. Do you know if AC Transit does that already or would that be something new? I've encountered it before. Okay. I don't know how much it's going on right now. Cool, thanks. Um, so um, knowing how many different kinds of demands and constraints you would feel from different communities, you know, including all kinds of riders, operators, staff. Um, how, as a director, would you balance uh, all of those different sides and, and form your approach? Sure. So my approach to politics has always been a bit more collaborative. And I think it comes from my experience working in politics at the state level, where there's such a broad range of opinion, as well as my experience working in architecture, where you got to work with everybody to get the project done. And my take on politics is that politics is kind of like transit, where we all have our different places we're coming from, different places we want to get to. But for the part of the journey where we're all going in the same direction, we can go together. <laughs> and I think that's the way I would start out is instead of trying to make huge changes right away, kind of feel out things, find out where those common points are and mm -hmm. start there and take it from there. Okay, I appreciate that, thanks. And so we are at about the, at a, the half hour mark and I would like to switch to the audience questions. And so um, now is a great time to submit some more questions. We've already been getting quite a few, but uh, yeah, find that uh, Q&A button and put something in if you'd like. Um, it can be, um, you know, whatever, whatever you're wondering about from Alfred. And so, but I, I have a little running list here, so I'll check it out and uh, get started. And so, um, first one is, given AC Transit's looming fiscal crisis, what's your plans for stabilizing AC Transit's operations over the coming years? Sure. So this is a challenge that every transit agency is facing. It's what's called the fiscal cliff, where the federal pandemic relief money runs out in a couple of years. For AC, we're in relatively good shape compared to most places, again, because our fares weren't that big of a piece of the puzzle to begin with. But again, we are one transit system. If BART has massive service cuts, that's going to affect AC transit ridership as well when people's train connection doesn't run anymore. So where things are looking is that there's going to be a need for some kind of regional 
funding measure, probably on the 2024 presidential ballot when turnout is high. And that's something I'm going to start laying the groundwork with talking with all of our local officials, state officials, mm -hmm. to make sure that we not only get that on a ballot, but have the consensus and all the endorsements behind it so we can win on it. Great, thanks. So next one is, can you explain your zero emission vehicle strategy for BART? Oh, you mean for AC? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm reading the question. Yeah, okay. I, I know BART, BART trains, but, I hope they're zero emissions. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah I, I, I think you're right about that. <laughs> for, AC. for AC. So AC is an interesting agency in that we jumped on the zero emissions train a little bit after the natural gas, com compressed natural gas era, but instead became one of the first to use the hydrogen. Then nowadays, more and more agencies are also using battery. And I think it was the debate over hydrogen versus battery. It's one of those things where it really kind of depends on what direction our technology, as well as the electrical grid takes in the future. Is uh, right now the advantage of hydrogen is you can refuel it faster than a battery, but we're seeing battery technology get better faster and faster as well. On the other hand, in the long term, if the power grid is all solar and wind, there's going to be times when there's a lot of excess energy, and perhaps making hydrogen that can be used for vehicles later on <laughs> is going to be where that energy goes. So. I think the verdict is still out on which one's the future. But I say I, I appreciate how AC is already doing a lot of monitoring of what they call a five by five program of comparing the technologies. Actually, one of the biggest challenges with both is the reliability of this new technology. It's still not quite as good as your plain old diesel bus. So that's one thing that really needs to go up a couple more notches before full conversion. But I would say, follow the science and see where it takes us. Mm. Great. So each transit agency treats their service area as an island. This is, this is reading the question. Um, how could Bay Area agencies partner together to make the rider experience better, particularly when crossing service area boundaries? Sure. So. I think the seamless Bay Area is the overarching framework. But just as my own experience as a transit rider, I found that the uh, way that Google Maps and some other websites handle directions, that's already made it a lot easier for people to take trips that cross agencies, where in the past, it would have involved opening up five websites or acquiring five paper maps. But now you can say, I'm going from Berkeley to Mountain View, and I'll tell you, oh, you take this bus, then you take this train, then you take that bus. And perhaps one place to start is before Seamless actually gets to full integration of fares and schedules, is to at least have a common app for people to find their way around. Because I know right now BART has an app, AC has an app. There are a lot of third party apps as well, but just having something that the whole Bay Area can get behind, that would be a great start. Mm. Okay, thanks. And um, okay, the next one is, do you think AC Transit should build more bus only lanes and where would be good places to do so? Yes, I think there's definitely some places we still need the bus only lanes, especially as we're seeing traffic get heavier and heavier. Uh, I know San Pablo Avenue is currently being looked at as the next big bus line. So I think that would be the best place to start and then potentially Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley as well. These are some of our busiest lines. The dream of course is the Bay Bridge. <laughs> so that might require some state action. Hmm. Okay, thanks. And um, how do you want to handle street furniture at bus stops? Sure. So I think that 
with street furniture, you got to have your basics. You got to have something to sit on and something to block the wind and something to block the rain or sun above. And it doesn't have to be super fancy. I think the off the shelf type of bus stops are fine. And I know San Francisco, they often have their custom bus stops, their custom garbage cans. We don't really need that on an East Bay. <laughs> Okay. okay, so the next one is the last question we have. Um, so unless somebody submits another one during you're answering this one, then um, after this, we'll move on to your kind of closing statement. So um, with that, um, what are three steps you would take to improve AC transit? Sure. So I would say the first step is kind of getting us back to reliability, because I think that's the number one issue facing bus riders is sometimes you only not only have one bus canceled, but the following bus canceled after that, and people are stuck waiting an hour. So I think it may be a means that we don't restore service as quickly, but I think restoring reliability is number one. So that's the immediate issue. Mm -hmm. uh, Medium term issue is where I think the seamless Bay Area, the schedule and fare coordination comes in, where right now there are buses that come every 10 minutes, every 15, every 20, every 25. There are different intervals, which doesn't always line up with BART and other transit agencies that people are connecting to, or even other buses that people are connecting to. So I think if we can get to some kind of clock based scheduling, that would be a great second step. And of course, also is getting free transfers both internally and to other agencies. Mm -hmm. And then long term is where the transit oriented development comes in, building up our tax base to pay for all these great things that we want to do. Great. Thank you. And um, some people have responded to the call, and we, we have a few more questions. Um, all right. We're, we're going to cut it off at 645, so we're not going to go all night on these. But um, so how would you handle the sheriff's contract? Um, Nine million every year. And for what? What role should they play, if any? Sure. So I know that Javanko has been calling for looking at the sheriff's contract. And are we really getting our money's worth? And I know there's been some staff items that have come up to the board about are there certain types of calls that can be handled by other agency staff and I think that's definitely what we need to be looking at because it's expensive and per hour and also as a total lump sum and if you can get other agency staff on there you might be able to provide twice as much assistance as you would have if you were hiring sheriff's deputies to do that work. Does that mean you would try to reduce the contract or end the contract? I think there's definitely an opportunity to scale it back. Yeah. Okay. I know in a couple of years ago, there are some serious issues with Alameda County Sheriff. I know we've got a new sheriff incoming who's hopefully going to be a lot better. So we'll see. Okay. Thank you. And what is the future of Trans Bay Service? Sure. Uh, so I know that uh, because of trans -based service was originally set up back in the key system era to bring suburban commuters to office jobs in downtown San Francisco. That is not going to be as big a thing anymore because of remote work. And especially now that BART still has a lot of capacity. However, there are a lot of non-office workers that work in San Francisco <laughs> because they can't afford to live in the city yeah. on that kind of money. And so that's really where we really need to be looking at is serving these essential jobs, serving students, serving seniors, going to medical appointments in the city, all these things that you still have to do in person. And that means instead of having rush hour only service to be looking more at all day service for trans bay trips. And I think there is still a valuable role for 
trans day service because if, especially for people who don't live near BART, if you are asking them to transfer from bus to BART and then to another bus in San Francisco, that's just too many moving parts and potential misconnections. So the one good thing about trans based service on AC is it gives people along Bancroft Ave in Oakland or MacArthur in Oakland, it gives people in Alameda, gives people north of the BART service area a one seat ride into downtown San Francisco from where they can get a bus to pretty much anywhere in the West Bay. <clears throat> Great, thank you. And how would you work with staff on improving AC transit processes? Sure. So one of the things with any kind of elected board is of course the staff often have much more long-term experience. So I think when I get elected, first thing I would do is to just kind of li listen and hear from the staff, all right, what are some of the things that have worked in the past? What are some things that we've tried in the past and didn't work so we don't have to make that mistake again? So again, going back to my philosophy of politics, just taking a collaborative approach and feeling things out to across the river. <laughs> Okay, well, thanks so much. And that is it for audience questions. So you're through. And so thank you everyone for joining us tonight and to Alfred um, for this whole conversation. Um, I hope people are feeling better informed about the issues at stake and about this, this candidate. So to wrap up this event, I'd like to invite Alfred to give a quick closing statement. Sure. Thank you, everybody, for taking the time to listen and be part of this transit movement. I've, I know I've worked with many of you before on issues from Bay Bridge bus lanes to seamless Bay Area to traffic safety, and I hope to continue working with you on all of that. And yes, keep recruiting new people to this movement because I know AC and BART are the only agencies that have an elected board. And so everything else, all the other 20 something agencies, it's often kind of under the radar and really relies on the public, people like you to be the advocates to fight for those funding sources that we're gonna need. So thank you so much. I'm proud to be endorsed by a lot of our local elected leaders, including our AC Transit directors, Javanka Beckles and Gene Walsh. BART board members, Janice Lee, Rebecca Saltzman, Devin Dufty. Hope to get your endorsements as well. And feel free to volunteer or contribute to the campaign at alfred2.org. We've got so many voters to reach. This is like running for Senate. <laughs> the AC Transit District is bigger than 10 states. <laughs> but together, we can do this. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Alfred. Thank you to all of our attendees, and thanks once more to our co-hosts, that is the East Bay Transit Riders Union, Seamless Bay Area, and Bike East Bay, and I hope you all have a good night.